Robert Nauer, CPCM, CPPO, and this is Season 2, Episode 2, dealing with the Navy and Navy Supply Corps. Now, I'm 70 years old now, and I entered the Navy in 1975, back when everything was analog, not digital. And things are entirely different today, and probably a hell of a lot easier. For instance, when I entered the Navy, and you served aboard a ship, there was no satellite telephone, no internet for immediate communications to home to tell your wife what you were doing and how you felt. Nope. All we had was snail mail. And the average time from the time you wrote a letter and put it in the mail and had the carrier on board delivery or the cod fly it off to say for instance Naples Italy to be then put aboard a plane to be sent back to the states via US postal service well the time just to get your letter back to your wife would have been 6 to 8 weeks the time to get a response back from your wife would have been another 6 weeks probably so about 16 weeks. That's a long time. And yet we sucked it up and we dealt with it. And that's the way we lived our lives. And today, today we have a bunch of pussies serving in the military who get immediate gratification from their children, their wives, can talk to them immediately if they want to via the internet or Skype. We didn't have that shit back in my days. In my days, when you served in Vietnam or you served aboard a carrier or a ship, you were remote. You didn't have the luxuries of talking to your wife or kids and being able to listen to all their problems. You couldn't deal with them. The wife really carried the ball back in those days and sucked it up. Anyway, that's not what I'm going to talk about here during this episode, but just to give you an idea of the way I really am when I talk about life, real life, the way things really are, well, the Navy in general isn't much different than it was back then, except that, on the surface, the Navy is supposed to be less sexual harassment, more racial equality, and promote um, equality across the board for races more evenly than it did when I was in, and the Navy was predominantly 95 to 98 percent white and not of mixed races. So, when I joined, as I said in episode one, to the Supply Corps. The very first place I went was the Navy Supply Corps School in Athens, Georgia, after I graduated from Officer Candidate School. Now, I did four years of college at UCF in just two years from the time that I graduated from high school. And that was also while working 25 to 30 hours a week. I had no life. I busted my ass I busted my ass, I studied, I wrote papers, and I typed them out on a damn IBM Selectric 3 and 2. Did all that and got through four years of college in just two years, just to go out on my own, before I made the decision to finally join the Navy and go in the Supply Corps. And I thought, well, college was tough, but I got to tell you, the Navy Supply Corps School, then at Athens, Georgia, today the Navy Supply Corps School is in Newport, Rhode Island. And I would have probably have preferred it to go there. But I'm glad I went to Athens, Georgia. It was a fun place, though you didn't have a lot of time to fool around. And I have to tell you this, that if the Navy Supply Corps School was as tough as it was for me back in 1975, then it damn sure is still tough today. 
I don't think it's as long. Uh, Navy Supply Corps School, you can tell me if you're in the Supply Corps differently. I don't know. But when I joined and I graduated from OCS and went to Supply Corps School, Supply Corps School was six months long. I went there in the summer, graduated in the winter, and it was immediately sent to the fleet, to the second fleet aboard the USS John F. Kennedy. And I got to tell you, Navy Supply Corps School, with all of the education, the basic education, and the special finger courses we had to take, it was tougher than college ever was. I tell you what, Navy Supply Corps School was a ball buster. I have never, ever experienced anything as educationally demanding in my entire life. And I have literally thousands and thousands of professional training hours. But I have never, ever, ever received as much arduous education as I did from the Navy Supply Corps School. That, my friends, is how tough NSCS really is. I remember one time, I mean, the tests were tough, but I remember one time when they told us we had to make pub changes. That's where you make changes to pubs, publications, or regulations because of policy changes. And the Navy routinely came out with changes to pubs almost every quarter. And they would give us these pub changes to make on the NAVSUP P485, the NAVSUP P this, the NAVSUP P that. I took a photograph of me and my friend who and roommate at the time, Harry McDavid, who was now captain, retired Harry McDavid, Supply Corps. And um, we had hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of pub changes laid out all over the floor of our apartment in Athens, Georgia. And I have, and I still have that photograph with the look of distress and concern on my face. How is it possible that we did what we did in an analog world where nothing was digital? And yet we did it. And we did it with gusto. And we did it because we were told to do it. And we were told to shut up and do it. And we did. Life during the days of analog living. In many ways, over this current digital divide that we live in, taught us a lot more about self-preservation, integrity, and working hard than a lot of millennials seem to understand today. The test taking that we took at the time was all paper. And we stressed out over it. And and the test scores that we received, they truly did dictate the quality and type of ship that you went to as a Supply Corps officer. Those who received the highest grades, the highest scores, and worked the hardest, usually got what was called independent duty and went to a destroyer or a tin can or a cruiser as the supply officer and those that didn't went to something else like a carrier or a larger ship or a shore station now i was a little different because i got married to a navy nurse right out of ocs shouldn't have done that and i'm writing a book about that right now and it's called i think it's going to be called rage anyway I made the mistake of getting married to a Navy nurse, and uh, she was a Polish girl from Philadelphia, and as a result, it made the stationing of both of us together very difficult in order to be stationed together because there were so few naval hospitals where she could go to. It actually limited my duty stations aboard ship. And the only place I could go was either Philadelphia, which there were no big ships there, 
that was mostly uh, reserved tin cans, were Charleston or Norfolk, Virginia, or San Diego. And she had gotten ordered to Philadelphia and then later to Norfolk. And so the only place I could go. And so the detailers did a good job trying to work all of that out. And they did. They ended up sending me to an aircraft carrier stationed out of Pier 12 in Norfolk Naval Station. And uh, the woman I was married to, the Navy nurse, she got stationed out of Portsmouth Naval Hospital about 15 miles away. So it really put a damper on my career by basically thinking with my dick rather than my brain and getting married right out of OCS. That was the stupidest thing I ever did. It it limited my career. It ruined my career in many ways. And uh, And yet... When I finally did get sent to the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy in I think it was June of 1975, I really, really enjoyed the jobs that I had there. And I'm going to talk more about that in a later podcast. But the six months of education that myself and Harry McDavid had at Naval Supply Corps School, Athens, Georgia at the time, was difficult, it was grueling, it was extremely demanding. More demanding than if you were to put eight years of college all compressed in six months. That's about how arduous the education was at the Navy Supply Corps School. It was tough. Damn tough. And yet, finally, when we got to the point where... We talked about uh, the reading of orders, and the reading of orders is something that occurs right before you graduate, where all the detailers have worked out uh, where you're going to be assigned to based upon your grades and recommendations. And I almost knew from the minute I entered the auditorium to have the reading of orders that I was going to be going to a very large ship. And so as the orders were read, which is a very, what would you say, fraternalistic kind of reading, those that got assigned independent duty to destroyers or cruisers and smaller ships, they really had a great job. They they got great assignments. I went to the John F. Kennedy as a dispersing officer. Now, I'm not to say that was any small job for it. It was a very big job. I became the paymaster for 6,000 individuals. I carried the money for most of the ships in the fleet. And I maintained $2.5 million in cash behind my chair in several safes the entire time that I was the DO or dispersing officer. It was a tremendous amount of responsibility. And um, it was almost overwhelming, truly, especially when you had to execute paydays. And I'll tell you more about that in the next episode, dealing with how I had to reconcile and balance the uh, dispersing office due to a $2 shortfall. (laughs) $2. Eight quarters uh, that I couldn't find. And it stressed me out to no end. Because the, during the entire time you went to the Navy Supply Corps school, the instructors routinely over and over would impart upon you that if you fucked up, if you did anything wrong, if you couldn't do your job correctly, if you couldn't balance your safe, if you did anything unethical or wrong, you were going to go to the big green table in the sky. Well, the green table is a court martial table. And they drilled that into our heads to the point that we were all generally scared to death of fucking up. So, anyway, 
Uh, by the time I got to the fleet and I became a dispersing officer as an ensign, I was scared to death that I would fuck up somewhere along the line. <laughs> and lo and behold, you know, I had this payday one time and I somehow came up two dollars short. Hmm. Boy, that was strange. I did find the deficiency and I did fix it. And I'll talk more about that later. But anyway, that's Navy Supply Corps School. I said that I had gotten married right out of OCS. That's not totally true. I transferred down to Athens, Georgia. Uh, the girl I was engaged to, the Navy nurse, came down there. And we got married in a very simple ceremony uh, at a Catholic church. And I wasn't Catholic. I had always been Methodist. Today, I'm agnostic and I really don't give a shit. But at the time, in order to marry her, I had to convert to Catholicism. Don't ever fucking do that. <laughs> Don't ever fucking become a Catholic. Oh my God, that was the worst decision I ever made. The worst decision I ever made in my life <laughs> was to marry a Catholic and convert from being Methodist to Catholic. Oh my God. Uh Somebody please shoot me. Anyway, so we got married. We both ended up in Norfolk, Virginia. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. Navy Supply Corps School was a very tough, tough school. And if anybody hears this podcast and is currently going to the Navy Supply Corps School in Newport, Rhode Island, please give me a call, email me, or write me. And let me know what it's like today. Because most of the people that I know today are retired admirals, captains, and commanders from my time frame. And I want to tell you this. I am really glad that I did become a Supply Corps officer. I am really glad I served in the Navy Supply Corps. It's a great community, great people. There are a few bad, bad apples, bad actors, but the bottom line is, if you really want a great career in business and to go places with companies like FedEx and UPS and other logistics company, you want to become a Navy Supply Corps officer, whether as a male or female. It is a great career, and there's tremendous opportunities for advancement in the Supply Corps. So with that, I'm going to tell you, I've got a couple books out that you might want to be interested in reading. They're pretty realistic about the Navy Supply Corps during the 70s and 80s. And one of them is entitled Murder on Steel Beach, a Navy Story at Amazon. It's also available in uh, Audible format. It's 17 hours long. Also have a shorter version called Chaos on a Cargo Ship. That's Chaos on a Cargo Ship. And I've got a bunch of other books out, too. But those are the two that really depict what Navy life and being a Supply Corps officer was like in the 70s and 80s. And if you really like a fun book to read, you want to read one of those two. Murder on Steel Beach or Chaos on a Cargo Ship. Okay, so with that, I'm going to end this podcast. And we'll start Episode 3 uh, early next week. Bob out. <laughs>